Launching in a week, SpaceX is demonstrating through the Polaris Dawn missions that it is doing more than any other company and perhaps more than a government agency to prepare humanity to be a multi-planetary species. Polaris Dawn and the Polaris program, as well as other human spaceflight missions through SpaceX, are really showcasing just how professional these missions are and how much the focus is on demonstrating the technology and the mission concepts that can move humanity forward beyond Earth, beyond low Earth orbit, even beyond the moon. What really differentiates SpaceX from other human spaceflight companies is that investment in paving their own way, paving the way for the vision of creating a multi-planetary species that other companies just cannot do or will not do. The focus with a lot of, in fact, all of the other companies has been on supporting government missions, which is of course, a worthy thing to do, especially since a lot of these companies do not have wealthy benefactors. But with SpaceX, you are seeing through Polaris program, through Inspiration4, through the new FAM2 mission, the focus really is on using private money, using individuals' visions to move us all forward. Not just a select few, but a large number of people. I am Lara Forsick. I'm the executive director of space consulting firm Astrolytical. I've been following especially human spaceflight, commercial human spaceflight for a long time. I even have a book that I wrote about commercial human spaceflight. The Polaris Dawn mission really strikes me as different. There was a press briefing today that the Polaris mission crew and Bill Gerstenmaier gave. I want to point out some of the highlights. I'm not going to repeat the whole entire briefing. I will link it below in case you want to watch it. I do want to compare and contrast that mission briefing and the mission profile of Polaris Dawn with what we've seen from existing and other proposed commercial spaceflight missions, private astronaut missions, space tourism missions. Polaris Dawn is so different from anything else I have ever seen. It is much more like a government mission than a space tourism mission. I wouldn't even call it a space tourism mission, even though it is entirely commercial, entirely privately funded. It, it is so fundamentally different from what other companies are doing or what other companies have proposed. First, I want to talk about the crew themselves. Jared Isaacman, who is the funder of Inspiration4 and the Polaris program. Polaris program is one, two, and three. Polaris Dawn is the first one. He is the funder, the billionaire who in times past and perhaps still is talked about in terms of a space tourist. That's not the right term for him, in my opinion. He really is more of a commercial private astronaut who happens to be dedicating his own money towards these private missions, which fundamentally are not tourism missions, even though they are private missions completely separate from the government. SpaceX is launching Dragon, but Dragon is a free-flying vessel around Earth orbit. It is not attaching to the ISS. It is completely commercial. And this crew really demonstrates that they are all not tourists, but professionals. Jared Isaacman is the only one who has flown previously, and he flew on that Inspiration4 mission, which again was not a government mission. The other three, even though they are newbies to space, I would not say in any way that they are tourist or unprofessional. What really struck me throughout that entire press briefing, I do recommend you watch it. What struck me was just how poised they were, how well informed, how well trained, like they've been training for you know, two, two and a half years. It really seemed much more like a government astronaut briefing than a commercial astronaut briefing. We have Jared Isaacman, whose background is not in anything, you know, spacey necessarily prior to Inspiration4, but he did have pilot training. He flew jets. Jared is the mission commander, just as he was for Inspiration4. Now, behind the scenes during Inspiration4, there was Scott Boutique. Well, now he's front and center as a member of the crew. He is the mission pilot. He has extensive background in flying for the Air Force. He is a personal friend and business partner of Jared Isaacman. So perhaps not surprising that he was chosen for this mission, but he has no space background. And then there's two people who are very interesting choices. Mission specialist Sarah Gillis and mission specialist and medical officer Anna Menon. And they are SpaceX employees. And I find this distinction very interesting because they are part of this private crew. I don't know the breakdown about how much or whether Jared Isaacman is paying for their rides. I assume he is paying something for all the crew members to participate in this mission. But these two people, they are SpaceX employees. They bridge, they are the liaisons between the space plate provider and the commercial crew. But yet there's not so much of a divide. For example, during the Axiom Space missions, Axiom 1, 2, 3, 4, you have Michael Lopez-Alegria and Peggy Whitson as the Axiom astronauts, the 
employees of Axiom Space who are guiding the commercial customers. And that distinction is not present here in Polaris Dawn, at least not that I can tell. These are full members of the crew. So even though this is an entirely private crew, we do have two members who are SpaceX employees, which I think adds to the evidence that SpaceX is putting their own skin in the game, in a sense, like real actual human beings, to advance the mission concepts and the milestones that they want Polaris on and the Polaris program to advance. I was a big fan of Inspiration4, so I don't want you to take this the wrong way. I loved the Inspiration4 mission. There is a Netflix documentary, by the way, if you want to check that out, I will link it below. There's just so much that Inspiration4 did to prove that you could have an entirely commercial mission. It was the very first entirely commercial mission. You know, we had commercial astronauts previously that interacted with Mir or the International Space Station or suborbital missions. And I will talk about suborbital missions a little later. But this was an entirely private orbital mission that proved that it could be done. And that was, I think, the main achievement of Inspiration4, aside from raising uh, more than a quarter billion dollars for St. Jude Research Hospital. It proved that it was feasible. It, it proved the concept. And many, many interviews that Jared Isaacman did, to paraphrase him, he wanted to not screw it up for the future. He wanted to advance the ways that we move humanity forward into space by not messing up Inspiration4, <laughs> by proving that it could be done. And he did that. He achieved that. He and his crew achieved what some people probably assumed could not be done. Of course, other people probably assumed it would have been done decades ago. But I think that a lot of people were still in the mentality that human spaceflight is for governments only. In 2020, SpaceX proved for the first time that a private company could launch humans to orbital space. Prior to that, only governments had ever launched people to orbit. That would be, you know, the United States, Soviet Union slash Russia, uh, China. Those were the only players in human spaceflight aside from suborbital spaceflight, prior to May of 2020, prior to Demo 2. And since then, SpaceX has been proving like systematically that not only can a commercial company and private individuals contribute to human spaceflight, it can contribute to moving humanity outward. So Inspiration4 proved that it could be done on a three-day mission, just low Earth orbit. Polaris Dawn really ups the ante here. Polaris Dawn moves it to an entirely different orbit. It is bringing people farther away from Earth than we've experienced since Apollo. It's not, of course, going all the way to the moon, although I would not be surprised if that is in the future for SpaceX or Jared Isaacman or both. It has the very first commercial EV private EVA, private spacewalk. And that is so dangerous. It's one of the main reasons why this flight, this mission, has been delayed for two years. Because initially, they were planning by the end of 2022 for Polaris Dawn. And now here we are. August 26th is the no earlier than launch date for Polaris Dawn. And the reason, one of the main reasons, was the fact that they needed to develop spacesuits and they needed to plan to evacuate the entire Dragon spacecraft because there's no airlock. So you have to release the oxygen that is in Dragon and in completely expose Dragon to the vacuum of space and put in all the contingencies and all the plans and all the ways that this could go wrong so that it doesn't go wrong. Not to mention the practice time and the spacesuits. In a moment, I want to talk about the development of the spacesuits because that is another point where SpaceX is really breaking ground here. But just the fact that this mission is doing a commercial EVA where no other commercial company, to my knowledge, has ever even considered this. Now, we did have Space Adventures, which was a company that worked with Rose Cosmos was the Russian Space Agency to bring private individuals to the International Space Station to um, experience, you know, living on the ISS for like about a week at a time. And at one point, they were advertising that they could do a private EVA with the Russians on the ISS. That never came to fruition, but also that is completely government involved, right? That would be a private individual who is paying the Russian government to go on a government, uh, you know, international government platform to do a spacewalk with government employees. So completely different mentality here. This here, this Polariston mission is a completely commercial mission. There's no reason if you're just focusing on tourism to have something so very risky. You could just have a joyride to space, you know, just like Inspiration4, where they all stay in the capsule all nice and safe, you know, you, the cupola, the window on top, the big domed window, and have that beautiful view of Earth. So the very fact that SpaceX is pushing this ground, and it's pushing this ground so quickly, that they are planning for normal people who can go undergo some kind of training, probably an abridged version of training, to do a spacewalk in the future. In fact, one of the uh, crew members was asked about this, and they really talked about the fact that they hope that the training will become less over time, that it won't be as long, won't be as involved in the future, so that more and more people can do something like this. 
checking out the spacesuits. NASA has been working on next generation spacesuits for years and it is needed. It is badly needed. These spacesuits that were developed for shuttle, they are decades old. They don't really conform to the majority of bodies. They're very difficult to work in. It's a very painful process to work in a spacesuit for hours at a time. Contracted out to two companies, Axiom Space and Collins, and both of those companies agreed to work on spacesuits because NASA gave them contracts to do so. But then Collins Aerospace decided that it wasn't even worth it to work on spacesuits, even though NASA gave them a contract. So I have a video here where I talk about how Collins Aerospace actually backed out of their contract, leaving only Axiom to develop spacesuits for NASA. Now, again, this is only because NASA asked them to. This is only because NASA gave them money. And here on the opposite side is SpaceX saying, not only are we going to develop spacesuits on our own outside of NASA's requirements, outside of NASA asking us to, but we're going to put in our own money. There was a question in the press briefing that sort of got a wavy answer, like a vague answer about who was paying for spacesuit development. And the response was really that it was distributed amongst the entire Polaris Dawn crew and SpaceX. So I don't really know what that means. <laughs> I don't know, you know, did, did Jerry Eisman fundamentally support the development through the funding? Or was it, you know, SpaceX deciding to use their own internal money to development funding for spacesuits? I don't really know. But the point is that it was a collaboration between a private company and perhaps one private individual or multiple private individuals to develop spacesuits completely independent of any government agency putting in money themselves. And that's not the only thing that is groundbreaking here. Then there's, then there's another reason why the mission was delayed for so long, and that's Starlink. I just had to look it up because it changes so much. They launched so many Starlinks. As of July, it is up to almost 6,300 Starlink satellites that SpaceX has launched in its constellation to provide internet to people on the ground, you know, individual customers on the ground through a low Earth orbit constellation, which is different from the way that previous internet satellite internet has worked at higher orbit. Starlink is now envisioned to connect spacecraft, specifically Plariston. That apparently is an engineering feat. If you are planning to have multiple missions that are in Earth orbit or beyond, you do want the ability to provide internet to those individuals. Many times during this press briefing, I probably should have counted, maybe maybe one of you who are bored, you can go ahead and watch it and count to see how many times they referenced a future where many people are in space. Many people are going on Starship to Mars. Many people are doing spacewalks or connecting with Starlink in space. They referenced the future like that repeatedly throughout that entire press briefing. That was the mentality that they had. That was sort of drilled in them. The reason for this mission was to have a future where many, many people are living and working in space or going to Mars. And here's where things get really interesting because of course SpaceX is not the only company or not the only uh, company founded on principles of many people living and working in space, uh, having a space bearing future, multi-planetary future, there are a lot of companies that are founded that way, space companies. Um, Blue Origin comes to mind with Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos has that vision of millions of people living and working in space. And Blue Origin is doing a lot in the background to advance infrastructure and transportation and research and development to make that future happen. But they're not doing human spaceflight to make this future happen. They have zero human spaceflight plans to make this future happen that they've announced so far, other than what NASA has contracted them to do. So again, it's the difference between what a government agency is paying a company to do and what a company is willing and able to do without that government incentive, without that government funding. Jeff Bezos has a lot of money. He could, if he wanted to, put in just as much resources as SpaceX does in advancing human spaceflight with these milestones, with these quick advances of how do we actually get many people living and working in space. But instead, Blue Origin has taken a different approach. They are working on various aspects of infrastructure, which is of course needed, but they are only doing human spaceflight right now in terms of either Artemis and suborbital space. And here's where I want to talk about the real striking difference between suborbital space and space tourism and what SpaceX is doing with Polaris Dawn, with Polaris Program, with Fram 2, with Inspiration 4. Because to the uninformed editor who's writing a headline, they will call this all space tourism, but it really isn't. There is such a difference between you know, Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos going into suborbital space and coming back down and popping a champagne bottle and saying, we did it. I don't blame them. I would love to go on a suborbital space flight. I would love to see the view of Earth from space. But that is space tourism. But it is not the same thing as what SpaceX is doing. And I have been watching, perhaps you've been watching for even longer if you're older, the different ways that 
different proposals have been made in terms of bringing normal human beings, you know, non-government astronauts to space. And it's usually in the form of space hotels, reality TV shows. Going back all the way to the 50s and 60s, you've got the Hilton hotels that were going to do, you know, lunar hotels. And even now you've got the, the concept of commercial space stations where they're serious research and development and manufacturing, but also space hotels. And the space hotel aspect, again, is for the tourism. It's for the person who is wealthy, who just wants to go up there and spend a week and have fun. And maybe they do research at the same time. So I, I don't want to just say that they are just space tours, just there for the joyride. But most of the suborbital ones are. Most of them really truly are just there for the joyride. And again, I don't blame them because that view of Earth, that way that changes your perspective, really does seem very valuable. And there, of course, are a few people who are doing it for research purposes. I have a whole chapter in my book about suborbital research and the ways that we can use suborbital human spaceflight to advance research in ways that we can't do on the ground. But research is definitely a secondary priority here. It's really more about the tourism. And when you're thinking about even going outward, a lot of it truly is the reality TV show concept, like Mars One, for example. How do you have a one-way trip to Mars that is entirely based around a TV show? So tourism, entertainment, you know, again, I don't want to knock it, but it's not the same thing as really advancing humanity in space. On the other hand, the commercial LEO space stations, commercial LEO destinations, they are really focused on business, catering not towards the space tourism necessarily, although that's still there, but catering more towards how do we make a business? How do we make this profitable and sustainable for our own business? And how do we cater towards other businesses? How do we cater towards, uh, you know, manufacturing companies or R&D development or, you know, some other business, you know, whether maybe it is entertainment, how do you cater towards a business that can make money in space and not necessarily how do you advance humanity in space? Although one could argue that making space profitable is advancing humanity in space. It's just a different way to look at it, right? It's not advancing multitudes in space. It's advancing the marketplace in space. But that's also where the contrast comes in, right? Because Polaris Dawn is not advancing the marketplace of space per se. It's advancing humanity in space. I want to end here by talking about the future of the Polaris program and also the FRAM2 mission that was recently announced because those are also examples of where SpaceX, along with private individuals, is advancing humanity into space in new ways through mission profiles. So Polaris 2, we don't have a lot of information yet because I had a, fe a feeling that Polaris 2 was envisioned to be that Hubble servicing mission that NASA decided to not go with. That was the idea that the private EVA that Polaris Dawn is doing would prepare SpaceX and Jared Isaacman and whoever else to do a Hubble servicing mission, a private mission where I assume Jared Isaacman would be putting his own money towards doing an EVA that would service Hubble because Hubble is an older observatory. It does need to be boosted. It probably could use upgrades. NASA did a study after that was proposed and they shot it down. NASA decided at this time that it is not going to let anyone except, you know, NASA astronauts touch its Hubble space telescope, which is something I disagree with, but I don't, you know, I don't blame NASA necessarily. I just think it's the wrong choice. Because NASA shot that idea down, I have a feeling that Polaris 2 is now reworking. Like, what is its mission? Polaris 3, according to the press briefing today, the first Starship mission, that mission is paving the way for all the other things that SpaceX wants to do with Starship. And FRAM 2, which was recently announced, that is a mission that is bringing private individuals, 100% newbies to space, to a polar orbit, to a 90 degree inclination, which has never been done before in all of human spaceflight history. Private individuals saying, we want to do this, and SpaceX saying, we will make it happen because we think it's important to test the limits of what we're capable of, of what missions we can do so that we can do more of this kind of thing in the future. I have been so impressed with what SpaceX has been able to accomplish in a relatively short time. And I would not at all be surprised if this is only the beginning of what SpaceX is doing with private customers to advance human spaceflight outside of what governments are doing. And if you're interested in what SpaceX is doing otherwise in terms of human spaceflight, I have a whole video for you to watch that I put out recently. So go check that out next.